right, anyway, let's get him on here. Let's welcome to the show the one and only Mr. Tom Beards. Tom, how are you doing, my friend? Hey, babe. Good, man. I'm really good. I'm in Lake Arrowhead, California. Doing great. Thanks. You know, first off, when I first was offered, uh, you know, from uh, from Harlan sent me an email about you right away. Like, I didn't even read about like what happened in your life, your book, etc. I just saw Philip Chancellor, and I was like, oh hell yeah! Because believe it or not, I grew up watching soap operas. <laughs> so, <laughs> the Young and Restless was on in my house growing up from when I was a small kid through most of my life. So I was like, oh hell yeah! Nice. And then I nice. like, I start reading all this stuff that you went through in your life, and I'm just like, holy cow! Like. My my head was spinning. I I don't know how your head's still on your shoulders right now. <laughs> yeah, it's been a journey, but we all go through stuff, right? Yeah. Well, not as much as you. I, I mean, that talks a lot as, about you as a person to go through this stuff. Thanks, man. Do, do you want me to tell uh, listeners who I am and, and what I've been through? Uh, absolutely. So introduce yourself to everybody. Okay. Uh, my name is Tom Beard. Most people know me from playing Philip Chancellor the Third on The Young and the Restless, predominantly 98 to 90, 96 to 99. Uh, and then I died, and I came back 20 years later as an openly gay actor playing an openly gay character, Philip Chancellor. He returned. Uh, I've written a previous memoir, Forgiving Troy, and that's about my paranoid schizophrenic brother that murdered our mother about the time that I left Jenny the Restless, 1989, and my miraculous journey back to him five years later where I was able to bring him to some lucidity and actually to remorse, which is pretty incredible because 70% of boys that kill their mother never get to remorse, but he did. So that was you know a big part of my life for sure. And now I've just written my sex memoir, Young, Gay, and Restless, my scandalous on-screen and off-screen sexual liberations, which I don't hold back, buddy. I don't hold back. And I was going to say that. I, did you, like, hold back anything? Like, it doesn't sound like you did. <laughs> no, there's no there's no point to it, you know. And after I wrote it, I realized an actor would not write that because it could hurt an actor's career. It's way too honest. Only an artist would. And I, that's who, I, who I've matured into. You know, I've been making a living painting for 10, 15 years. And my, my soul, my personality is much more of an artist. That's why, you know, I'm an alternative thinking person. And that's why I would write something so bold like this. Uh, also to find out, you know, am I okay? Did I overcome all that sexual shaming of my childhood? You know, because growing up gay in Wisconsin in the 1960s and 70s, uh, you know, when there was, there was homophobia, certainly there, there was homophobia phobia in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, so uh, I, I'm just putting it all out there. Because I also feel that giving something, you know, you can't just, you can't just give them some uh, polished cake with frosting, you know, you got to give them, Give them the truth. Give them something that they can walk away with. And people find my book liberating because it is so honest. Now, you, you said um, you, like, you didn't hold anything back, but were you not like kind of scared to like really put this stuff out there? Because, I mean, you do name names, too. Like, I saw the names come out, and I'm just like, wow, okay. Like, Sure. Uh, well, it, it, it's interesting because, yeah, I mean, I do name some names. But I also, it's very, I don't like to hurt people. I don't want to hurt people. So there are a few people in the book that I had to change their names because they would definitely be hurt by what I had to say. But okay. the other people, like the actors that I had affairs with or David Geffen, who romanced me when I was 22, I don't say anything negative about these people. So I don't feel a need to hide their names because I'm just reporting the truth. The photographer that sexually molested me or assaulted me when I was 21 he gave me a uh, pill, some drug, and he, you know, I fell out of consciousness, and he was lowering my pants, and and uh, I was out for hours and hours. I don't, I don't say who he is because it's 35 years later, and right. maybe he's changed. You know, I, I, I don't want to fight. I don't know. I don't know. But there's stuff in the book, like I talk about having uh, fat injected in my penis and other cosmetic surgeries. 
And I never even told my boyfriends that. So it was only in writing this book that I decided, you know, it it just all has to be said. My journey is amusing, and people should laugh with me, you know. And now <laughs> that's complete. It's tied up. I can go on to something else. Now, uh, uh, talk about that. I mean, this whole penis augmentation thing, like, I didn't even think that was really a thing. I, I, you know, I thought it was just like something like that was made up that people joked about. And then I see that you had it done. I'm like, holy cow! Like, <laughs> uh, I, I was turning thirty, and I wasn't a movie star like Tom Cruise, like I thought I was going to be. But I had some money from the soap opera, so I was having some cosmetic surgeries to look better. I finally had my veneers put in because I never liked my teeth. I had my face widened a bit. Uh, with silicone and, and buckling, I had my ears pinned back, and uh, we were removing uh, fat from my stomach, a little bit of fat there, and the doctor was uh, one of the foremost at penis experimentation, if you will, and I wanted uh, my penis thicker or bigger, and so he did take some fat from my stomach, inject it mainly around the base of my penis, which which made it uh, straighter. It was a little crooked. It gave me a little length, and it gave me a little girth. So, uh, you know, I'm very happy with that, but it's nothing that I talked about until now. You know, uh, I was embarrassed about it. Yeah. How painful was that? Oh, I, I was drugged. I was, uh, no, no pain. <laughs> I was out. I was out. Because, you know, they were pinning my ears back, so that's that's major surgery and lipo. Yeah, that was major surgery back then. Wow. So, famous. Okay. <laughs> so, so now something you said too um, Going back to, to writing the book You said how An actor would not write this book An artist would So I guess you don't consider yourself an actor any longer? No, not anymore I don't I would take acting parts to promote my art I always sell more paintings when I do An acting gig But sure. you know I, I, I just I studied myself so long I could act but I'm really not that. And even beyond that, I'm more of a spiritual seeker. That's what I was since I was a little boy. Uh, you know, that's really predominant. Uh, but no, definitely an artist mentality. Interesting. And that's, like you said, that's how you've been uh, supporting yourself and living for all these years then, huh? Dude, yeah. Look, I mean, I look back on my life. And almost every day of my life, I was doing something creative that I loved. I wrote a lot of screenplays that didn't go anywhere. Where there was one option. I wrote a lot of books, and now I'm self-publishing a lot of them coming up. But, you know, I've always done what I've wanted to do, so I've always stirred that big creative drive of mine. Uh, so I've been very fortunate when I, when I see how much time I've had to, you know, not only me time, but creative time. When so many right. people resent their lives and are so busy and can't do the things that I do, and yes, right. I figured out you know how to make a living at it as well. So I'm very fortunate. And now I live in the mountains. Every day is like paradise. I was in Hollywood 29 years, and I had social anxiety that I talk about in the book. Even going to free clinics to see if they could help me because I had one uh, paranoid schizophrenic brother that killed our mom. My other brother killed himself maybe in paranoia, uh, I could have gotten a diagnosis to get free medication and maybe a monthly check, but I didn't do that. I just wanted, right. I just wanted not to be so nervous. And uh, I didn't really have that. So, you know, now that I'm away from people, I'm much happier because I'm not feeling bad that I'm not more social. Yeah, I mean, for, like I was finding like videos, videos of you on YouTube and stuff like that. And it's like it seems like you're like pretty much in uh, seclusion almost. Oh, it's great! It's just rental forest home right next to the forest. I'm here with my two rescue dogs. Uh, there's not even a house around. It, it is perfect. And people say, "How how can you do that? You know, that's a fantasy life." I'm paying a thousand a month to rent this two-bedroom lodge home, and I pay twice as much in Los Angeles for an apartment. So it's affordable. Yeah. It's just that you've got to give up people. <laughs> you got to give up, you know, that kind of career and all that PR stuff, which I was willing to give up. Plus, like we mentioned, I can make a living on my art, so I can go anywhere, really. Right, right. 
So, so with the book now, and you said you self-published uh, your, your last book and this book, um, don't you think something like this, you, you could have got like a major um, company behind you? Edit, you know what I mean? Like a publishing company behind you for this? No, or you I tried. I tried. Really? I was surprised too because I thought there was significant material there. No, all they they all turned me down. It wasn't commercial. Now I'm used to not being commercial at this point in my life. I've heard that all my life. I'm not commercial, so it actually worked out fine because now I know how to self-publish and I make more money self-publishing. And I've got five more books, two of which I'm publishing this month, three more next year. So now I know how to do it. So. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Now, are those books about yourself as well, or are these fictional books? Or well, let's see. I'm working on uh, in a couple weeks. There's going to be a coffee table size book, and it's called 100 Black and White Male Nude Prints and 100 Pictures of the Artist. So it, some of it's on me, but I have painted so many male nudes over the years that I was able to put them in a black and white book that's pretty large. So, you know, I'm real pleased about that. And then the other one that will be done in a month is how men really feel about being sexually assaulted. I've been collecting stories on that for years, and so this will be a compilation. And it's not all what you expect because, you know, let's go back to the time of 21 when this photographer assaulted me and drugged me, etc. and I could uh, barely get in my car in the morning and I hit a couple cars going home. Uh, most people would think, oh, well, did you call the cops or did you just hide from him? And I was like, no, I called him up and I said, how about those free headshots you promised me? So, you know, in this way I relate to the Cosby accusers because even though he assaulted them, some of them hung around him. And the damage was done. This photographer had yeah. already assaulted me. I was never going to take a drug from him or a drink, and he had promised me headshots. So, you know, the way I handled that was different. And that's the point of this book that I'm coming out with in a month, is that, you know, men do react differently to being assaulted. Now, how about, like, how long have you been working on on this book? Or was this something that was, like, inspired by the whole Me Too movement that's going on in the last year and a half? Well, not really. I mean, a couple of years ago when people were accusing Trump of sexually assaulting some women, I forget who at that point, I put on Facebook, I think I've been sexually assaulted. And then a bunch of my male Facebook friends also added their stories. So that's when I decided, oh, I'm going to write this book and add mine to it. And then uh, I just became so... Uh, involved with my own journey, so that's why I wrote 400 pages of Young, Gay, and Restless, uh, because that was supposed to be part of this other book, but it, it's so much material that stood on its own. But that was yeah. The I, I saw in the one video, you're like holding the book in your hand, flipping through it. I mean, it's a big book, 400 pages. That's a huge book. <laughs> right, dude. Right. But it's so freeing as well. I mean, imagine writing down all the things that you've been embarrassed about sexually your whole life, it's freeing. It can be terrifying at first, but essentially it's freeing. So, so you sound uh, like a, like a, maybe like a whole load was lifted off your shoulders, like there was like a therapy session for you writing this book? Well, I guess so, but it's not like it's not like I was haunted by any of my sexual past. No, I just found it amusing. Uh, yeah. No, so it's not like I felt there needed to be healed feelings, but but what happens is when you write about your life, you see the patterns come up. You know, I had so many boyfriends, and I left so many boyfriends because I had a a commitment uh, phobia, you know, and so you see all these patterns in your life, and and that is certainly cathartic. How about, like, um, talking about, like, all the different sexual partners and all you had, like... um... And, and it sounds like, like a lot. It sounds like a lot. I mentioned I, mentioned I spent with 200 guys sexually, but, you know, that's over 40 years, so that's only like five a year. And the truth is, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot, I guess. But the truth is, you know, I was looking for true love most of the time. I was looking for a boyfriend most of the time. I did have some years in my 40s where I was really fine with just sex. 
But now I don't want just sex. It's been it's been a while since I've had sex, and I'm really not looking for that. I'd really like a partner again. So we'll see what happens. Like in my neck of the woods, there's not a big uh, gay dating community up here. I thought I was going to say, have you have you found love? Uh, you know, searching for all these. I years, did have find you... love, absolutely, baby, in me, in me. I feel so complete. You know, I don't feel mm-hmm. like somebody has got to finish me. Uh, not at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm very whole. I, I will not be clean, and I don't think there's a soul partner out there for me. But you know, I'm entertaining. I've got a lot of drive. I can be funny. I can. I'm good in bed with role play. I can certainly attract a partner that could offer me fun as well. We could have fun together. You know, but I don't think I'll ever. I mean, I can't imagine taking vows to say, I want to be with you forever. Because to me, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to promise something that, that you, you that's in the future. So, right. I don't know. Are you, are you married? I am. I'm actually uh, 21 okay. years married. All right. And, and how is that? <laughs> that's a huge commitment. It, it is huge. It is. You know, it's right, right. some days it's great. Some days it's not. It's a roller coaster, but, you know. I, I truly okay. believe and, and, and know I found uh, found my one, and uh, okay. <laughs> I'm blessed to have her. I can't say that she's blessed to have me, but I'm blessed to have her for sure. Uh huh. And you guys got kids? Yeah, yeah, we have three kids. Okay, all right. Three kids, two well, kids and a cat. Um, um, wow, I mean that, that's so much responsibility that most people take on, and I also share in my book I avoided that. You know, I'm pretty lucky that I wasn't straight because I, didn't, I I really didn't want to give up my me time and raise kids. I admire people that do. My mother did and one killed her. You know, I'm kind of soured on the whole idea of having kids. So, sure. uh, it, you know, it, it's all inspiring to me that people do that and almost everybody does that. But I'm glad that I don't have to. And, and with your brother too, I mean, you, you wrote the the story and then put together a small documentary about it. Um, I, 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 that's one thing I don't know if I'd be able to do. And I mean, it took you time to do it, but you, you said you forgave your brother after I think it was five years. Right. Yeah. It really is a miraculous journey. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, unbelievable events that led me back. Long story short, my appearance in his prison five years later was the reason that he was medicated because they needed permission from a family member and none of us wanted anything to do with him. And he was really out of his mind. Whether he was schizophrenic or not when he killed her, we don't know. The uh, right. the doctors disagreed on that. you know. Uh, but he certainly was five years after he killed her. So uh, because I went back, he was on medication and uh, yeah, he, he was able to come back and uh, we were able to be there for each other as brothers which certainly was beautiful but I didn't forgive him uh, thinking that was well I forgave him because she was already dead you know and I believe in life after death but you know what good would it have done for me to yell at him he's already in prison for the rest of his life you know he really needed a big brother and I was able to be that big brother when he needed me to be well now, something else that uh, subject that you talk about, and th- this one really um, kind of made me drop my mouth. But Jeffrey Dahmer, like, what happened there? Right. When I was uh, I, I, at nineteen, I was able to get a bartending job in a gay bar in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which was I, I grew up in Kenosha, so that was the nearest big city. And Jeffrey Dahmer would go to Club Two Nineteen. I would bartend on the third floor. And I actually had a lover, a big, hairy, muscular cowboy type that bartended at the basement bar. And one time, uh, he heard a voice say, there's a serial killer in your presence. And he looked around, and it was just his customer, Jeffrey, so he didn't think anything of it. Years later on the news, when Jeffrey Dahmer is arrested, he's like, oh, my God, the voice told me, you know. And and Gary, yeah, the psychic cowboy, he was also instrumental in helping me go back to um, forgive my brother Troy through another psychic message that he had. Wow. Wow. 
how did all this stuff find you in life? <laughs> that, that's, did, did you ever figure that answer out? It's interesting because uh, somebody else was mentioning that uh, it, it seems like so much has happened in my life, but I don't think that much has. I mean, getting married and having kids, that's huge stuff. That's huge stuff that, that you go through, you know? So uh, I just went through different stuff. Yeah, I guess, it, it, yeah. This is, it doesn't seem like, I mean, I can understand that it's an entertaining read, you know, what I've been through, but it certainly doesn't seem, you know, it seems pretty ordinary to me. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I did have great drive to move out to Hollywood by myself at 21 and want to be a movie star and then land up on a soap opera three years later. So I suppose I stand apart there for most people because I guess I had more drive than most. I mean, I'm 48, and I wouldn't go out to Hollywood myself right now. <laughs> well, I hear you. <laughs> now, how about, like, if, if they came to you and said, uh, Tom, you know, like, we, we read your book, and we, like, think there's something here we can – now, I, I was saying to my co-host earlier, Nick, uh, I don't think you could fit this into a movie. I don't think there's enough time. I think this, like, your book can be made into, like, a Netflix series. <laughs> That's funny. When I, I did uh, I, I did fantasize this becoming a movie, mostly because, you know, ever since 1980s, even before as a child, we're all familiar with the Young and the Restless team. Nadia scene. But the Young and the Restless has only played that around heterosexuals for over 40 years. And I thought, if it's a movie, it'd be funny to hear that song with some of the outrageous gay stuff or the alternative sex I talk about, it'd be a funny juxtaposition. So I don't know <laughs> if they'll ever do it, but I'd watch. Yeah, absolutely. Why not? I, I think it would be good. I, I, I think know. Netflix, they would go to the extreme of it and all. Like, they wouldn't hold back. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I did have producers interested in forgiving Troy for a movie for a long time. And it didn't it didn't quite work, but uh, yeah, I mean, I will send this book to one of the big agents that was interested. So who knows? Who knows? Now when they whatever they, happens happens. I guess. I'm gonna be <laughs> it's <thing>. true. <laughs> now you were it got to be one of them, uh, uh, and I can't even say it's a rare soap opera character, but one of them characters that got brought back to life so many years later. <laughs> right. Yeah. That happens in the soap. Nobody really dies, huh? <laughs> so what did you think when they when they called you up 20 years later and said, we, we, we want to bring your character back? Well, they didn't. And this is probably something I should mention here because that's another through line in my book is that I do, I do, uh, I am the catalyst for almost all the events in, in my life. Uh, uh, I approached Young and the Restless 20 years after and I oh, said, okay. how about this? How about you bringing me back, and how about we doing this? And they liked it. So uh, we did it. Yeah. Yeah, so it it, uh, it felt good because I had grown so much, and, uh, you know, homosexuals had much more of a voice, too, in those 20 years. There was the huge right. age scare in the 80s, you know, and everybody was much more relaxed about it. Uh, when I went back 20 years later, so it, it was good. It was it was an important thing for me to redo, and I'm certainly glad I had the opportunity. Because how many of us have the opportunity to go back to a job 20 years later, right? Right. Now, when you went back, how much of uh, the character of Philip Chancellor the Third? How much of that character was really Tom Burt's? Well, you know. That's kind of a, it didn't do well. And here's why. Because the Young and the Restless, uh, they went with the storyline that I faked my death for 20 years because I was gay. But in my mind, if you fake your death, you really got to be scared or in a horrible place. So there's got to be homophobes in Genoa City. And they never explored that. So I came back having an attitude feeling that Philip must have an attitude because, you know, because he would rather be dead 
than he is. But right. the Young and the Restless never wrote that for anybody to see. So it kind of seems that I was just a dick and uh, <laughs> and unfriendly. But I had subtext that worked for me. But, but that's it. It didn't work for everybody. Uh, uh, now, uh, go, going on to the, your world of art, like – I, this might be, I don't know, I, the pressure. I, I mean, I, you, you've been compared to like legendary artists like Picasso and Van Gogh and Warhol. Like, like how that make you feel? Like that would frighten the hell out of me. Oh no, it's a huge compliment when anybody says anything about that. I mean, it's just good press. I think you know my best stuff. Is my unedited expressionism, uh, and those I call my blue X paintings, and they're at my website. I've actually got a thousand prints at my website for like thirty-five bucks. But you know, I mainly do portraits now. You know, that's how I pay my bills is I paint people's grandmas and their pets and stuff like that. And that's totally different. That's a lot of work. That's hard because you have to get every area just right, or it doesn't look like them. But when I'm really right. at my best, just flowing with the expressionism, it, it's not realism. It's just, it's odd, it's unique, it's very Tom Beards. And, th- and that's where that's where artists have such an advantage, because an actor never has that much freedom. An actor is given a script, told what to say, they're told what to dress, you know, they're, somebody puts some makeup on them, and then they got a director telling them how to do things. You know, so actors can be great, we've got wonderful actors, but they don't really create that. They don't create the whole thing. As an artist, you have that freedom to create the whole thing, and, that, and that's much more exciting to me. Now, w- when you sit down to do a, a painting, like when you're just doing like a free flow painting, like do you ha- like have something set in your mind you're going to paint, or do you just let the brush go and just let it flow out of you? Yeah, that's my best stuff is when I just let it go, when I spill my when my subconscious down, and then it's like I stand back and I think. Oh, yes. I was just at that party and I was nervous. And that's that guy that I felt bad that I wasn't talking to. Oh, and that's, that's the bartender. Did I tip her enough? You know, then I can see through these images what spilled. Uh, yeah. So if, if I have talent that are, that would be it. Is that there's a free flow, free flow there. Nice. Now, were you always uh, interested in, in art and doing art, paintings, and stuff like that? Or was this something that, like, over the years you just grew up? No, absolutely. And that that's why I'm so happy right here, living in a mountain cabin, isolated at my choice, working on my creative projects all the time. Because I did that as a kid. When when my brothers were playing with the neighborhood, kicked a can or something, I was more happy with my light bright, you know, or an Etch-A-Sketch. You know, I've always enjoyed projects by myself and so I look at my life now which may seem extreme to people but it's not it's really more consistent with who I am than the soap star people know because that was that took a lot of courage for me to you know purport to be an extrovert which I was able to do uh at some points you know but yeah but I'm, I'm a real creative guy real creative guy always working on something now, have you uh, has anybody reached out to you about the book that you, you've written about in the book? And did have, yeah. Well, I had a couple people, mm, uh, but I changed their names. I mean, one seemed pretty upset, but I changed his name anyway. Uh, and he was very, yeah. I mentioned very, very minorly, but he was offended, but. Nobody would recognize him. So, uh, yeah, and it's interesting because I do include a couple pages from a, uh, somebody I don't know that was contributing to my sex assault book, and and he was talking about how Hollywood is really uh, there's a gay mafia, there's seduction, there's casting directors that sleep with people, you know, sleep with actors for them to get the jobs. And so I did include that in this book, but I really disguised the names and tried to delete people so that they wouldn't be identified. However, uh, just a couple of days ago, one of those casting people that I know he was talking about 
uh, private messaged me on Facebook, somebody I met years ago, and I didn't put it together, the guy, that this one says, you know, you have to have sex with to get a job on this particular soap opera. So, uh, you know, he did a, he did say congratulations on your book and good luck, and I don't know why because I haven't seen him for years, and he never propositioned me, but I just wrote back, look, you know, my book is not intended to disparage anybody except me, you know, and I want people to be ultimately inspired by my alternative choices and being perfectly happy and healthy at 56 years old where I'm at. So, uh, you know, again, uh, this book, it is a tell-all, but I don't want to indict anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody. That, that, that doesn't feel good. I, I get nothing from that, so I try to avoid that. Well, how about, like, when you hear all the um... – I mean, for a while there, it was almost every day you're hearing uh, the accusations coming out on people about the things that went on in Hollywood. Uh, what's your feelings on that, on that, on everything that's happened? Are you kind oh, of like I'm all for it? I'm all for disclosure. I think it's great that people are speaking about things, especially things that they were shamed about. Uh, cool. More power to them. You know, absolutely. And I, I do mention a, a celebrity in my book, who, when I was dropping off my painting, uh, he was giving me a tour, and then in his bedroom, he grabbed my crotch and pulled me to him and stuck his tongue, and he wasn't letting go, and, uh, you know, there was no way he should have thought I was interested in him. I never was, but I don't even name him in the book because uh, a lot of my Facebook friends said, well, you know what, that's not really assault. He was just coming on to you, and I was like, well, I don't know what it was, but... uh, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to get in some lawsuit over that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll just step away from that and avoid that. Unless, you know, unless tons of people were going after him, and and I felt he was a real creep today, then I would. Then I would step right. up. But I don't. I don't have the information that says that. You know. Uh, you know. I was just flattered. You know, because I've been assaulted. Several times, you know, I really just took it as a compliment for the most part. I mean, I, luckily, I, I mean, I wasn't raped. I wasn't beat, you know. I was never, nothing like that. That'd be horrible. Right. You know, I never had to deal with that. Yeah, I can't imagine that. No, no, no. No, it's horrific. I don't excuse that. People wow. shouldn't do that. No, right. So the book is out today. And, and I mean, you got to be excited. Like, so, how long were you working on this? I mean, was it a, a couple of years or? Yeah, a couple of years, two years. Wow. Yeah, so it evolved really nicely. I'm real pleased with it, and people will find it liberating. They will find it jaw dropping, and liberating. And uh, how I autograph the books is sex naughty, Tom Beers, because that's the question I keep bringing up. I'm gonna. I mentioned stuff in the book that people think is naughty. And I want them to rethink it. If it's not hurting them, if it's not hurting anyone, you know, is it okay to have taboo fantasies, etc.? Uh, yeah, because too often people shame each other. They're always judging each other. Yeah, and I mean, it's gotten less in, in some areas over the years, but I still think, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think people still do think sex is naughty. Right. Yeah. And that's see I see that on Facebook all the time. From both the Democrats and the Republicans. Like if 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 a, a Democrat hates uh oh my god, I think it, Melania Trump, they'll say even today, she posed naked and I write, Well, is that naughty? And then if a Republican hates uh Clinton, you know, he may say, Well, you know, Bill Bill had a blowjob in, in his office and I write, Is that naughty? I mean, I just don't think, I don't know, we're adults and we're constantly waving our fingers saying, naughty, 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 naughty. <laughs> right? It is. It absolutely is. It absolutely is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. too funny. Too freaking funny. So now, are you going to be doing a, an audio book for this possibly or? I don't know. I haven't considered that, but uh, that might be a good idea. It would take a long time for 400 pages. Yeah, that's the one thing. It's a lot of reading. Yeah. 
great indeed. But I myself prefer audio books. So me too. I, know, I suppose there's a market for it. Do you? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a lot a lot easier just to to listen than it is to actually read nowadays. So wh- where can everybody get the book? Where's the best place for everybody to get it? Well, ideally, if they go to TomBeards.com, you can go to my book page, and I give you all the links there. So you can go to Amazon instead if you want to buy it, and that gives you the ebook link as well. Uh, or you can buy it from me, and I can autograph it to you. Uh, nice. So if people go to TomBeards.com, that's best. If not, just look for it up on Amazon, Young, Gay, and Restless. Awesome. And actually, too, if they go to your website, your uh, – your paintings and stuff like that are up there too. They can get prints or order art from you. Yeah. Or... My bios there, my prints are there, my paintings are there, examples of all the styles, and even some videos on what the book is about, and even some interviews from the news and stuff. So, yeah, my site's got all that. Awesome. Well, Tom, congrats on the book, and uh, Thanks, thank man. you, thank you for uh, for doing this, and you know. I, I'm Dude, telling you, sound you, like, you sound like such a nice guy. You sound like such a nice straight guy. It's <laughs> 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 oh, too funny. <laughs> too funny. So, well, cool. enjoy enjoy the cabin life out there, and uh, much success with the book. And uh, I'm telling you, Netflix. Uh, I'm looking forward to a Netflix series about this. All right, I hope so, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Tom, man. Take care. Nice talking to you. All right, buddy. Thanks for your time. Bye. Bye. All right, there he goes. Tom Beards. Check him out. Go to his website. Go directly to the website. Get the book. The links are there. It's T-H-O-M-B-I-E-R-D-Z dot com. Get all the info on the book, his bio, his artwork. He is truly an amazing artist, and that's that's no bullshit. So go. Check it out. Buy the book. Get an autograph.